Welcome back to Today on Bay TV. I'm Gaynor Morgan and I'm joined now by Noel Rees of the Phoenix Theatre Group. Welcome, Hi. thank you for joining us. Hi it's there. a busy time for you. You're gearing up for yet another production. Next week, yes, we're doing a, a court drama, which mm -hmm. is very popular usually because all drama has to have conflict and you have plenty of conflict <laughs> in the court. So it's called okay. Justice is a Woman and it's at the Fullness internationally next week. And who's in it? Um, well, it's a very large cast, actually. Mm. We've got 21 in the cast. Oh, that's um, a lot. We've also got a very large um, jury because in this production, of course, the audience is going to be the jury. <laughs> so they've got to decide what, what's, what's going on, guilty or not guilty. We've got 21 in the cast and quite uh, remarkably, 18 of them are men. Quite often in community amateur mm. theatre, you find you have lots of ladies, mm. um, but we're very strong on the men, so we've only got three ladies' parts in this particular play. But of course, the title, Justice is a Woman, the leading lady is the lady who plays the justice part. Oh, fascinating. And it's a great fascination, isn't there, with, with, with criminal dramas. But you, have you direct, I know you're the director of the Furnace Theatre Group, but have you directed the play? Yeah, I've directed this one, yes. And we're on our last rehearsal out of the theatre tonight. So we're running it. And then on Saturday, we move into the theatre and we open on Thursday. So it's, uh, it's quite a complicated play because it's got four sets. It's technically demanding. And of course, we've got to uh, reproduce a courtroom on stage. That takes some doing. It is, indeed, yes. Uh, about a month's painting work down in our <laughs> workshops. Nothing is hired in, it's all made. Every production is individual mm -hmm. and costumes and things. Do all the props and cro props, props yes. yourself? The only thing we've hired in for this show are in fact all the legal wigs. Oh, right. Because although we know lots of friends, <laughs> we didn't want to borrow them in case anything <laughs> no, went wrong. Really, no. So all the wigs are coming in. But the plot sounds fantastic. Highly regarded uh, English barrister Julia Stanford heads the Scottish courts to defend a young man charged with murder of his even younger girlfriend. So who wrote it and, and in what era? Well, it, it's, it's set in the 1960s. It was written in about 1967. And the interesting thing is it's, it's co-written by a man called Jack Roffey and Ronald Kinnock. And Jock, Jack, uh, Jack Roffey was, in fact, um, a clerk at the Old Bailey. So oh, he right. knew all the ins and outs. Mm. And so he used his experience to write plays and they were very popular. It came out in the 1960s. And I don't know if you remember that when ITV first came out, there was a TV series called Justice, oh, yes. starring Margaret Lockwood. Yes. And yes. she was the lady barrister. Popular, yeah. And this is the play on which that series was written. And then he went on to write another play called Hostile Witness. And that, that eventually became another ITV series with um, Michael Dennison, which was called Boyd QC. So he's used his background experience to write these plays. Mm. It's a fascinating play. Um, it's got a very strong storyline. And uh, we find that Lanetti audiences like storylines <laughs> more than anything else. We all like a good and, story. And uh, we hope we're going to fool them. And there are many twists in it. And so she has a terrible time getting to the truth. The interesting thing also is that it's set in Scotland. Hmm. So in order to reproduce the Scottish the court, isn't the it? law is different. All the procedures are different. So I think the audience is going to find it fascinating how many changes there are between our civil mm. courts and the ones in, in Scotland. And of course, when it's written by someone who's, who's been in the game, as it were, there's much more authenticity, isn't it? For instance, John Mortimer was so popular. Absolutely, and then he Rumpel. created Rumpel of the Bailey. Mm. Um, and, uh, and kept the day job, didn't he? He kept the day job as well. But this is very fascinating. And also, she goes, what happens is, because it's set in Scotland, um, they wanted to have a Scottish QC to defend the boy. Mm. But no, they brought in a woman from England. All oh, right. So we've got tension within the court mm. between the two QCs, the defence and the prosecution, as well as other levels which are in the play. Mm. And it, it, we, we were discussing it in rehearsal on Monday, and it's a play about loneliness. And there's a lovely line in it, and the young boy who was accused says, you don't have to be old to be lonely. Oh, and if yeah. you look at all the characters, lots of them have got their own individual lonely lifestyles. It's quite a feat to, for you as the director to bring all that together. Good. How many characters did you say? 21 about? characters, four sets. Yes. And then we have to do all the publicity and uh, to sell the show, mm. because usually you're only as good as your last show. Mm. What is it, though? Because there's a 
tremendous fascination, isn't there, with, with amateur dramatics? You know, what, what, what is the fascination? There are so many other calls on our time out there, online, on the TV, on the radio. Well, I, I think it's you're sitting with an audience and you get the reaction of the audience with you. You all help, you know, you perform it and uh, you get the feedback from the audience mm. rather than sitting at home and you might be chuckling with your wife or your children. But when you've got an audience of three or four hundred, you get an extra buzz out of the occasion. Mm. And of course, the, the cast and the people who belong to the group, how, how people are so busy these days and you've got to have a range of ages, haven't you? You can't just have people who are retired and got plenty of time. We've basically got about 40 people in the company and they, the unfortunate thing, when you're, when you're an amateur company, when you have very good young people and they come and join oh, you, you for instance, the lead, the young boy in this is mm. 17, but we know next year he's going to go off to college and we lose them. So although we have young people in it, quite often they're only with us for about but two or three years. What a wonderful training ground for them. Well, well we, we think so because we'll do all sorts of plays. Mm. And he start, the boy who's 17 now started off five years ago with us. Mm. And uh, he's grown in maturity and in his experience and his performances. Mm. So uh, that's nice to see. And then you have people who are always in the plays and uh, members of the audience where is so-and-so in this play. <laughs> oh, good. I like him. He's a good comedian. So you've got, they, and quite often you can see the people in the street. I think that's another attraction. Yes. That, you know, but you're constantly recruiting, presumably? All the time, yes. Mm. Recruiting all the time. Mm. And um, most people, we don't really have auditions, we have readings. Mm. And then we look for people, we have a stock company, and then if we want extra people, they come in. So it's not so nerve-wracking then? It's not quite so nerve-wracking then. And what about finance? It, it costs a few bob, doesn't it, to put on a Well, yeah, like a normal play now will be about seven, eight thousand pounds to put really? on. Yeah, hiring the theatre, you see, we hire it for a week. Yes. Royalties, Yes. and everything else and getting, getting the sets. Um, but it all comes from box office. Now, we've been going 46 years. And so you're completely self-financed? We are totally self-financing. And in those 46 years, we've never had a jumble sale or a coffee thing. <laughs> Everything has come from the box office. So that's a great source of Because our first right. president used to say, if we have to resort to these other things, <laughs> the public don't want to see us. <laughs> I think that's amazing because it was a very, very different world 46 years ago, wasn't it? It was. And our, our first play, we were, basically we were formed in the church. Mm. And we did um, a Christian play in the church, in the parish church in Tlenetli, for Christian aid. And that was called Christmas in the Marketplace. Mm. And it was two shillings and sixpence. Oh, bless. And most of that money went straight to Christian aid. And then we developed from there then we for a few years we worked in the parish hall and um, we have quite a good record of having reverends in the company because we've had about 15 reverends there are two reverends in next week's play justice in the woman <laughs> one of whom is a lady reverend so uh, <laughs> Well, that's they all get their opportunities. But you, you started, you founded the company. Yeah, we founded it. And so, so I know, as you said, the first one was in the, in the church, but why did you feel there was a need in Tlenetli for, for a theatre company? It was one of those things that happened, and most of us were parishioners, and after a harvest festival one night, we thought, well, let's do something. And so we founded the company. The name Phoenix comes from a line in the first play that we put on. Right. It was an adaptation of a French play. And, um, well, we like Topsy, rather, we've growed and growed. Mm. Did you expect to be continuing for this long? Um, Did you expect to be continuing for this long? Well, you always say when you get very tired and very <laughs> weary, oh, I'm going to have a break, but then for some reason you get a buzz and then you start off on the next one. And do you get full houses? Do you have, you know, I'm glad to say we were very well, yeah, we're very well attended. Uh, the last one we did when I came on, and Keith Millwood was with me on that occasion, we did an Agatha Christie, and about 1,200 people came to that. So she draws them in, and uh, that was very popular. That was called The Hollow. But... We all feel that this play is better than an Agatha Christie because it's got a thriller element, it's got a whodunit element. Obviously, the boy isn't really guilty, what the alleged... No, no, it was spoiler alert, spoiler alert, well, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, but I think it's pretty obvious from the start. How many performances have you done in your long career? Oh, I wouldn't... Well, I've done about 180 plays with this group. And then, of course, I taught drama for years, so there were all those school plays and things like mm. that. So I've done quite a few. Mm. Did a few in Swansea, mm. um, directed Gendros Amateur Operatic, did two productions for Abbey Players mm. and The Grand. So I've sort of been around a bit. And um, you've done about 120, haven't you, with Phoenix? Yeah, with Phoenix, about 120. Yeah. So how often do you perform? Well, usually two or three times a year, but we do other things as well. For instance, although we're doing major productions at present in the theatre, we do charity events, and every two years we do a murder mystery dinner. Oh, and that's that raises right. about four or five thousand. 
That's one a, evening, and we love that because it's interactive. Yeah. And uh, everyone who comes to it, they're allowed very, to talk to the actors. And, but to get uh, back okay. to um, Justice is a Woman, when yeah. can we see it? That's Come on where? next week. That's the 19th to the 21st in the Fullness in Italy, and it's Thursday to Saturday of next week. And where can we get tickets? You can get tickets. I have to look down here again because <laughs> it's a telephone number. Um, the box office is 0845 226 3510. That's 0845 226 3510. Or they're also online theatres. So we can just Google you. You can Google us as well and yes. Google so, Theatre I see Gar. And it's at the edge of the edge of the city. I think so. Everybody's rather shocked at what's happening in it. They think they're going one way and all of a sudden it goes. Well, I love way. the foreigners, so I'll try and get that. There we are. Thank you so much. Riveting. After the break, I'll be talking gardening with Neil Barry and Richard Beale. See you there.
Welcome back to Today on Bay TV. I'm Gaynor Morgan and I'm joined now by horticulturalist Neil Barry and Richard Beale, who we know so well from the Swansea Ramblers. Well, you're both very green, aren't you? And you're both mm -hmm. indulging in pastimes that I think are these days said to be good for our mental health and well-being, aren't, aren't they? Being out in the open air. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it is. It's great for your well-being, both physical and, and mental, really. And even though you might spend a day out working hard in a garden and physically, you can be really tired, but you know, mentally you can feel mm. energized and just so much mm. better. Or even half an hour, you know, if you've got something on your mind, just you know, indulging yourself in a bit of weeding or cutting the lawn or, or whatever it is, and you can just focus on that. And you could have taken this from Richard Beale's handbook for ramblers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out he's a member of Swansea Ramblers as well. We All right. Until today, so yeah. chatting there just now, yeah. 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 But th that's the same story that you're, you're saying to yeah. us such a lot about the ramblers. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, we find that people, particularly people who live on their own, to go out walking, mm. they chat to other people, they make new friends, uh, and it's relaxing. Yeah, okay, the weather sometimes can be poor, but other times it's great, you know, and people really enjoy it. And while a few of us are fortunate enough to be able to spend our whole working lives out in the open air, we can all do a little bit, can't we? Even if you're in a flat, you can have a window box. You can indeed, yes. Yeah. Out of all, you know, there's allotments and there's gardening clubs and things like that. So it's a bit like what Richard was saying. It can be quite a social activity as well. You know, around Swansea, we're very lucky. We've got lots of allotment societies and gardening clubs, and, you know, people can go along and indulge their, their passion there even if they don't have a, a, a space of ground. But I think what Richard was saying as well about walking, you know, that the conversation kind of flows naturally because you've mm. got something in common that you're yeah. talking about because people might say, oh, I won't know anybody and what will we talk about mm. and things. Mm. But no, I, I think from your accent, you come from a country originally where conversation flows naturally, mm. yes? It, it is indeed. I'm from Cork and with a pair of the Blarney Stone is. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. guess the Blarney Stone, but, yeah. but I haven't got uh, quite your lilt. Yeah. So um, what brought you to Wales? Wales Yes. Well, originally I moved from Ireland to London and spent many years as a, a corporate slave in London. And then <laughs> in my early 40s, which was about 15 years ago, I had a, my bit of midlife midlife crisis and decided, do I really want to be doing this? You know, I was in a very good job um, and all that, but um, I thought to myself, no, I want to get back to the land, really. So I had a, a wonderful opportunity of uh, going to Kew Gardens on a traineeship for three years. And uh, during that time, I had you know, worked with some world-renowned experts and also went to college at the same time to get some qualifications. And during that time, I came across some really inspiring lecturers who inspired me and, and motivated me greatly. So I thought, oh, if I can pass on some of that passion and enthusiasm yes. to people, I... Great You're a freelance horticulturalist. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so it's all it's all to do with education of various sorts. So I teach at the National Botanic Garden of Wales and I run courses for the Royal Horticultural Society, both locally and in England as well. And then I'm also involved in what's called the Community Voice Green Spaces Project, which is a lottery-funded project in Swansea about encouraging local communities to make as much use as possible of their green spaces. And, and how is that going? That's going very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's going really well. So the fund, you know, we've brought different communities together. One of the most exciting ones we've been working with the African Community uh, Centre and they've got a project with refugees and asylum seekers and uh, we've got an allotment in, in Swansea where they come along once a week to, you know, it's, it's growing food obviously is the, the main objective but it's more about, you know, a social ac activity as well of bringing people out, doing something and then within that area, some local people have also started volunteering. So again, it's sort of breaking down barriers, you know, and creating, you know, better but community cohesion. But also for, for refugees and asylum seekers, it's a, it's a way of rooting them and, and yeah. giving something a purpose. It, 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 it is indeed. And they've got fascinating stories. And when you hear their stories on a one-to-one -one basis, you know, you often hear various stereotypes in the media and so on. But when you hear individual stories of, you know, what they've been through and so on, it's really fascinating. But having the gardening as a, as a common bond, a bit like the walking mm. as, as mm. well, really. You've got something to, to, a reason to turn up. It's not just, you know, come along and talk to us. You know, it's mm. actually doing something as well as you go so along. Important. So many common themes running through this. Yeah. Because, yeah. Richard, you, you always talk about the bonding nature of, yes. of rambling yeah. and walking together. Yeah, well, it's definitely true. I mean, I, I've said this before, but I've been a member of Swansea Ramblers for five and a half years, and I probably know about 100 people now that I didn't know before. Mm. Uh, some of them I obviously know better than others, but we go out and every time there's, there's people I know, sometimes there are people that I haven't met before. Mm. 
Um, perhaps I could move on to one of the walks we did recently. Uh, I was just going to ask you where you've been lately. Yeah, um, Manith Madhvai is north, um, north of the Carmarthen Vans, uh, near the Usk Reservoir. And the walk we do around there, we visit the site of some Roman marching camps. And uh, the person who normally leaves it wasn't able to come, but we've been there before. And these camps were quite big. One of them was about 30 acres and probably it hold about 20,000 soldiers there. there. Are. Is that and you guys? Is, uh, we are walking up there. So is this behind the village of Masvai? Uh, it's above, really, above. Uh, much higher up. You, you access it via the Swansea Valley, really, and head in to almost oh, north it's northwest of Brecon. completely yeah. different. Yeah, it's a completely different area. Uh, some oh, wild horses up I there as well. Um, yeah, we couldn't, couldn't resist uh, photographing those. Because um, they're of, kept, actually, to keep the vegetation down, aren't they? they do, yeah, yeah, they do. And it's interesting, we often have new people on the walk, mm. and one of the people there was from Catalonia. Very oh, topical. Right. Yeah. And his English was good. He'd been to Swansea several times, and the friend he was staying with normally comes with us, but she wasn't able to walk, so she sent, sort of sent him along <laughs> and chatting to him. And, of course, you had to talk about Catalonia, and mm. he was very strongly in favour of independence. Oh, that's interesting. So it's sort of, you meet all sorts of interesting people. Talk about all sorts of, of yeah, different things. Yeah, all sorts of things. All sorts of things yeah. It's still a magic place up there, isn't yeah, it? it is, yeah. Have you been up there? I have indeed, yeah. I was, was saying to Richard earlier that I led a walk there some time ago as well, and there's, of course, a connection with the physicians of Mudvai. Mm. Wonderful and, story, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. And again, going back to plants and yeah, herbalism yeah. as well, and, you know, as well as growing... Pre because pre the interesting pants. thing about the positions of, of Mazvai, a, a farmer about 20, 20 years ago or so ago, I don't know what happened to it, but he started growing herbs in that area on a commercial basis because it's the soil and the microclimate and everything that actually naturally encourages these herbs. Yeah, yeah, right? you, yep. you, oh, it is, yeah, very much. Yeah. And sort of, you know, in the days before we had the synthetic, synthetic uh, drugs that we can get today, you know, everybody, the herbalist was mm -hmm. very high up in the pecking order. And they there. particularly grow in, in, in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Why the story arose. It really. was indeed, yeah. Uh, but I was saying to Richard, I was leading a walk you know, some time ago again in that area, but there's also a stream which was renowned to have special powers, a bit like spa, spa water, really. Mm. Anyway, so I spent quite a lot of time trying to track down this mm. stream, and eventually there was just a little trickle of water, anyway, so it was quite a disappointing after all this effort. So, <laughs> And it would, it would involve quite a detour as well, <laughs> so I decided that, you know, we won't bother detouring, detouring on it. But yes, that it is, you know, the, the we are so lucky having yeah, such wonderful are, landscapes yeah. out of nearby. Yeah. Well, one thing, walking, but I suppose um, if, if you're gardening, is it, is it all, all the year round? Sort of like it, is, it can be, yeah, sort of, you know, you can make your garden, you know, really sort of as, as a labour intensive or as low maintenance as you as you want to really obviously this time of the year it's beginning to go into dormancy and to, to close down so, so you know what should you be doing do, now like, uh, well if I mean the, the lawns will still grow so if you you know because we haven't had any cold weather as yet so you can still carry on it's cutting quite the, lush the, out there at the moment mm. isn't it it, yeah. it is indeed uh, so mm. any herb, herbaceous plants you can cut them back now at this time of the year if you wanted to have a nice tidy garden but it's actually quite good to leave them on there because they'll it will provide some protection to the plants over the winter when we get frost and also for wildlife as well lots of the seed heads and things like that you know birds will be able to benefit from those so sort of things like so that. Is there anything you should be protecting um, with winter coming on? Yeah so yes a lot you know, if you've got borderline hardy plants then you can either you know cover them with things like hessian so things like tree ferns and dahlias and things like that some of these ones can you know depending on where you are some places they'll be okay and some places not but yeah you can lift them and bring them in so out of, you know, either into a porch or a conservatory or a greenhouse if you're lucky enough to have things like... And once you've done it all, if all else fails, you can get out in the hills with you guys. Absolutely. Or to the coast. Yeah. yeah, well, we're off to Kington this weekend. Just wanted to quickly... It's in Mid Wales, is it? It's in Hereford Church, yeah. right on the border. Uh, mm -hmm. Offers Dyke. Yeah. And the Offers Dyke path runs through Kington, so it's very much a border town. And I'm leading the two long walks we're doing, two shorter walks. 52 people going, so we've got a lot of people going. How short is the shorter walk? Uh, six miles. <laughs> you call that a short walk? Yeah. I yeah. saw Offers Dyke for the first time not so long ago, and it's well worth yes. um, a yes. visit. What well, a visit, a walk. You know, fascinating. And Hargis Ridge, it's, I'm told it's pronounced Hargis Ridge. Mm. I thought it was Hargis Ridge, just outside Kington. And Mike Oldfield, is, one of his albums was Hergis Ridge, because I think his studio was in that area, in Kington area. Things you learn. Thank you both. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Very grateful indeed. And thank you really to...
to all our guests for joining us today. And of course, where would we be without you at home joining us and online, tuning in and we'll see you again tomorrow.